What is up, members? How's it going, everyone? Just had a little bit of time, thought I would go live. And I know Donnie on Standing for Truth is going to be having a debate fairly soon. So I thought I would not be able to help myself and uh, go over this. Hey, Matt, Iron Matt, what's going on? Today, I thought I would touch on a couple of things that I really think are great evidence for young earth creation, and that is symbiotic relationships. Everybody's heard of them, but today we're going to cover some things that I think are very fascinating. Before I jump directly into that, though, I wanted to ask a general, basic, logical question that I think anybody can follow along with. And that is, what is this right here? It's walnut. Does this think... Does this know anything? I don't think anybody would conclude, yes, of course they do. No, no one would. Everyone says, no, it doesn't have a brain. It doesn't It doesn't rationalize anything. You can't debate it. It doesn't process tomorrow. Then the question arises, how does it know when to grow? How does it know when to sprout? Because if this falls off the tree in winter, it won't do anything. Because it knows, wait a minute, but it can't know anything. Yet it knows to not sprout then because it will die in winter. So that brings us to the next question. If it doesn't know anything, it means this is there's only one option left, and that is this is programmed. This was designed to be like this. That's its function. It doesn't know when winter is or when spring is. It was designed to fall on the ground in spring and when warm water rushes over it, it blanches and begins to sprout and grow into a tree. That's a natural design. That brings us to our next topic, and that is symbiotic relationships. And what better thing to look at than a bird? Because a bird has a massive influence on the world around us, and we just don't even know that it does. For example, did you know that not even trees could exist without this bird. And I don't think a lot of people know that. And that's because the frequency of their chirp, the bird chirp, opens up the stomata on the bottom of the leaf and allows the plant to breathe oxygen. That's right. And it also will allow this plant to grow bigger, better, and stronger depending on how many birds there are. So without birds and without the chirping in the morning, they will not allow the stomata on the bottom of these plants to even open. Here's a picture of what it looks like open and closed on the bottom of the plant. Of course, you can't see this with the naked eye. It takes a microscope. But this is the man who invented it. His name is Dr. Dan Carlson Sr. And in 1970s, to assist with conventional and organic farming, particularly with low water availability and poor soil conditions, he wanted to come up with a concept of what can I do to make these plants grow bigger? He's holding the exact same plant in both hands and they are the same age. Now, that's what really matters. Why? Because all he did different was replicate the sound of the frequency that birds chirp and he isolated and played it directly to those plants that you see in his left hand on the right hand side of the screen. And that allowed these plants to grow rapidly. Being a scientist and family of farmers, he noticed that he was abruptly woken up in the morning, an hour before the sun rose every single day to uh, birds chirping and being very loud. And he was wondering, why in the world are they doing this? Clearly, this isn't a mating call. So what's happening and why do they do it year round? So being a scientist, being investigating this, he thought the next thing, logical thing to do would be like, let's test the surrounding area. And he soon discovered that it was the plants that would open up the stomata based on the frequencies from these birds. So what he did is he said, I wonder if I can isolate this and play it directly into plants. And sure enough, the plants listen and they hear it and they uh, can now open these stomatas. And he said, what would happen now if I were to completely isolate this only the frequency in the bird chirp and produce this sound to the field um, or specifically to one type of a crop? 
let's say corn, for example. Well, there you have it. You can see what happened is it wasn't just the uh, stomata that opened up when they played high frequencies and constant frequencies to the plants. The plants uh, didn't open the stomata just wider. They actually had more of them grow under in the leaves themselves. So plants were able to grow exponentially fast, much taller, produce more fruit. It was unbelievable. For example, a black walnut tree, it takes 35 years to grow to maturity, but they sell for thousands and thousands of dollars. So he figured, hey, if this works on a tree that takes that long to grow, what would happen if you were to cut that in half by just a frequency? And it worked. So now people can grow black walnuts in half the time and make twice as amount of money. So it worked and it works on fields where there isn't much mineralization. The topsoil is kind of eroded. The plants just do better. And so that all comes back down to the symbiotic relationship. If plants can't exist without these birds and these frequencies, what did they do before birds existed? You can't have it, right? So very interesting. And here is a picture of the untreated uh, uh, stoma on the bottom of the leaf, uh, very small. And then we have it when it's treated, there's more of them. You can see them all around and they open larger. Uh, these were taken with electron microscopes and, um, he's been doing this for a very long time. And Sonic Bloom is the name of the company that patented his formula. Um, and now they sell all kinds of things, but it's, uh, uh, the, things themselves, the speakers and the frequencies that do the best. I tried to download that image earlier. It looks like it showed up completely wrong and didn't work. <laughs> I have these little bot pictures, uh, boxes, but let me check a uh, comment section for everybody. Oh, they're headed off. All right. Iron Matt, I will see you next time. And, uh, just a heads up for everybody, uh, standing for truth. We'll be having a debate in uh, 15 minutes or so. So everyone head over there really soon. It is Kent versus Atheist Jr. So just a reminder on that. And let's see. I think we went through everything. Yep. Just a nice little symbiotic relationship there. We also see it in different things like fig trees and wasps. There's a fig wasp and a fig tree, and the, and the wasp pollinates the fig tree. Another great symbiotic relationship where they, they get along together and they work together to support each other, and one can't live without the other. So just fascinating things. Um, thought I would share that with everybody. Those two things struck me as I woke up this morning. I was like, you know what? I like plants. I, I, I'm into herbalism and health and longevity. And there's a couple things in that field that I just never talked on. And I thought, ah, why not share it with everybody? Uh, so I hope you enjoyed. And oh, we got more joining. Maybe I should stay. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I can stay. I, uh, why not? Right. Uh, talk about a couple different things. Um, one thing that I find very funny is when I go into the comment section, especially on Standing for Truth's channel, um, I find it ironic that a lot of people say that the no, there's no evidence for Noah's flood. Um, that is the most absurd comment I've, I think I've, I've read, uh, especially for anybody that's been on our channels for any amount of time. I mean, I have playlists that are so deep with evidence for a global flood. That means that they didn't find a single piece of evidence in any one of those videos convincing. Now, I personally think they didn't watch any of them. Or they started with already so much anger towards the subject, they couldn't even get through it. Or they watched it on mute. <laughs> Who knows? But the mere fact that uh, I, I started documenting things that I, I could go down the list um, for evidence. For example, I got um, whales on top of mountains, uh, geologic shifting, pushing things where, they're supposed, uh, where they are today, uh, speciation rates being so fast since the flood that we can really just count backwards and land on exactly how many would have been on Noah's Ark. Um, we have modern day animal tracks that are found in basement layer rocks that shouldn't be there. All animals uh, in with dinosaurs, all uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, we have dinosaur graveyards. We have all, all the evidence of that they, all of the disasters that put these things there were were made from a flood. So they said, oh, it's just local floods that did it. 
Uh, we have adult T-Rex buried under 60 feet of mud that died of asphyxiation trying to gasp for air. I mean, what could bury a Tyrannosaurus Rex? A local flood? You kidding me? A local flood buried a Tyrannosaurus in over 60 feet of mud. And that's mud today. They, they have to go back and say, well, there was... That was 65 million years. Imagine the sediment erosion over 65 million years. That would have been far deeper than 60 feet that we have today. This just it just makes matters worse for them, right? So uh, we have Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone National Park where they went down all the 27 layers and found um, not a single living species or animal of any kind or insect, but yet all of these trees that were just deposited there going through all these supposed geological rock layers. We touched on that a little while ago. Um, you know, the uplift in, uh, Lake Titicaca where the salt water is, uh, 12,500 feet where aquatic fish from the sea are still in it. Puma Punku at 13,000 feet. The temple was completely destroyed by a flood and it was discovered under 12 feet or eight feet of mud in different regions. Even today, it's still buried under mud. They're still excavating people or, um, uh, regions of that area. Um, gold's very heavy, so it should be in the deepest layers, right? But and, and around volcanoes because they would be ejecting it from the deeper layers. It's not found around volcanoes at all, and it's not in deeper layers. It makes no sense geologically, as according to evolution. We have, um, you know, closed clamshells in every layer and even on top of Everest. That doesn't make any sense unless they died from a flood. Uh, land animals with fish in multiple pictures, B dinosaurs eating birds that they supposedly evolved from. Uh, dinosaur uh, death pose that's found everywhere, you know, which is from asphyxiation again, from drowning. Um, yeah, the Ashley phosphate beds with dinosaurs and human beings, one of my favorites. Uh, mixed with everything, by the way, there's woolly mammoth there. There's megalodon shark. There's alligators over 100 feet long. It's incredible. It's just all mixed together. Um, unbelievable. Uh, then we can get into the geologic or um, biological evidence, which is some of my favorite. I mean, well, of course, we can go on um, with the geologic evidence, but then the genetics is what destroys it, right? Because we have uh, low genetic diversity, which means mutation rates aren't very high uh, in things. There's not a lot of mutations, but the fast mutation rate is in everything. So that can only mean one thing. And then we have genetic diversity about the same in every animal on earth. That means it had to go into a bottleneck. There's no other way around that one. Uh, then we have uh, the King's List, which is an unbroken chain of lineages from the Kings going all the way back to Noah. And then of course to Adam, but that was only 10 generations. So pretty obvious there. So we have uh, linguistic evidence, uh, genealogical evidence. We have, um, was that paleontological evidence? Now we have uh, genetics and biology evidence. I mean, it's really over. We have the haplo groups that show branching out directly from three people, three main haplo groups. Uh, oh man, it's just I don't see how somebody can look at all of this and say, "No, nope, don't see any evidence." I'm not seeing it, guys. <laughs> just not. I don't see any evidence there at all. I'm going to stick with that fairy tale that makes things up as it goes along and changes every decade. <laughs> That's for me. All right. Well, guys, I uh, just wanted to do a quick thing. I'm just ranting at this point. So uh, hope to see you guys over on Standing for Truth. Uh, begins in I don't know, 25 minutes. Uh, I was wrong earlier. So I will see you guys there and have a good night.